The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Unlocking the genetic code of cancer, all types of cancer, is an ongoing research endeavor that when completed will be a great leap forward. POG is a BC Cancer Foundation, Genome BC, and Terry Fox Research Institute program designed to offer personalized oncogenomic treatment to cancer patients. The program is a clinical research initiative that started back in 2012, and the aim is to decode the genome, like the entire genome, the DNA and the RNA inside the cell of each patient's cancer, and then provide information in a way that can be part of a treatment planning and decision program for that patient. The POG program has and is working, and since its beginning, uh, data sharing has been recognized as a fundamental element in the success of the program because it supports and enhances local, national, and international research, which then drives innovation and science in cancer research. I invited Dr. Marco Mera of BC Cancer to join me for a conversation that matters about the final frontier in defeating cancer. So is that an achievable goal? that we can actually, through personalized oncogenomics, win this battle with cancer? So uh, the winning of the battle of cancer needs to be framed, I think, in terms of, of discrete steps that can be taken. And POG's first initiative really is trying to use uh, and measure the, the ability to use uh, very sensitive genomics technologies to try and find uh, the genes that, when altered, uh, promote malignancy. And then using the information, if we can find th those driver alterations, we can try and align the profile that we generate from each patient to the pharmacopoeia of drugs uh, and thereby uh, try and match a patient profile to a drug treatment. So this is, this is not the moonshot uh, mm -hmm. that, that uh, was alluded to in, to in the introduction. It is instead uh, a very practical approach that is heavily focused on feasibility. So can we, in a, a routine and systematic way, collect the information, this very, very complex information? Can we reduce that information for each patient down into a form that can be interpreted by docs? And can the docs then consider that information in erecting treatment plans for their patients? So that's where we are now. It's gone a little bit beyond that. Uh, and now we've seen that, yes, we, we can do that. Uh, the question is, at what scale uh, can we do that? And so we need to be able to imagine that we'll be scaling up. Now, the, the other critical piece is when new drugs become available uh, anywhere in the world, uh, what do they target? And do we have patients within our system of data collection that can be aligned to that drug? And so typically that's tested using clinical trials. So what we're doing now is using our same system by which we're aligning patients to the existing pharmacopoeia of drugs. And we're saying, can we also align those folks to drugs that are being tested in these clinical trials? And can we start clinical trials? And the answer to that appears to be, yes, we can. So it's this evolution uh, along a practical trajectory uh, that, we, that we seek to follow. You used a, a very important word in your description there, and you said, complex. And the complexity of it is, to me, um, mind-blowing. Because I think, okay, you have this particular cancer that is manifesting itself in your body, but that same cancer may not manifest itself in the person sitting next to you because their genome and the state of their health is different. So how then do you take that information from that one patient and say, oh, well, here's this drug that will work for you when we don't know for sure because we don't even really fully understand what the, the drug interaction between the, the natural genome is and that of the drug. Because mm -hmm. you gotta, it's like you have to have the cancer genome, you have to have the patient's genome, and you have to know the, the molecular or genetic structure of the treatment. How do, we, how do we pull all that together and make it so that it's a practical application for a patient? Yeah, well thanks for that question because that's exactly what we're doing. 
and have done now to the tune of about uh, 1,000 patients fully analyzed and about 1,400 recruited on to study uh, here in BC. So what is done uh, is a, if a physician uh, considers a case and if, if the case, a patient, is eligible for POG, uh, usually what happens is uh, a biopsy is arranged. And so what we do is we ask for a small bit of tissue from the biopsy from which we can, uh, so the biopsy is of a, of a cancer, mm -hmm. from which we can extract nucleic acid, so the DNA and the RNA. And then we can put these, these analytes, uh, the DNA and the RNA, onto the genetic sequencing apparatus. And, and the apparatus that exists today is remarkably powerful. One instrument can do upwards of 10, 15,000 of these assays a year. Uh, this is not technology that we had when I was working in St. Louis on the Human Genome Project uh, <laughs> right. in the late 90s. This technology has completely revolutionized our ability to generate the data. So we, we get the biopsy, we get a blood sample, the blood sample represents normal, and we generate the genetic information for the cancer and for the blood sample. And then we compare them for, for each patient. So we say, okay, if, if the normal and the cancer differ, where do they differ? Mm -hmm. And we can measure that difference across all the sites in the genome. And we come up with a list of things that appear to be specific for the cancer. And with those specific things uh, that are unique to the cancer, we can then say, how does that, that information align to the pharmacopoeia of existing drugs? And so that's all computational. So we have mm. very powerful computers and we've developed software and used software that others have made available uh, through publications and, and access, other access types. And we can read out uh, the drugs that might align uh, to that, that particular patient. Uh, an example may be uh, Ill illustrative. Um, so we, we were able to sequence uh, a, a lung cancer in which we found a very bizarre uh, fusion, we call them, where one bit of the genome uh, is juxtaposed to another bit of the genome in the tumor, which, and that doesn't happen in the normal. So we found this. And this particular rearrangement, or a type of it, had been found before uh, in a different context and, and had been shown to activate a certain molecular pathway that led to uncontrolled proliferation of cells. And it had been shown in the lab and, and in some patients that there was a drug that countered the effect of that cascade. Mm -hmm. And so once we found that aberration in a lung cancer, we said, well, this other context in which this observation has been made may apply here. And because uh, this patient, and indeed most patients in POG, are, are, um, are resistant to treatment and at a very advanced stage in their disease, uh, we were able to obtain that drug and try it in this patient. As a clinical trial? A, a, as an experiment. Oh, as an ex oh, not even a at the clinical not trial even stage? A, okay. Not even a clinical trial. And so it was an off-label. Mm -hmm. And so that experiment brought very significant radiologic and clinical benefits. So we could measure it on, on imaging and the patient felt better for, for a very long time. They eventually uh, progressed. We then continued on and so we put that observation in, the, in our database. We say, we, we've seen this. Yeah. And then we saw it in a different kind of cancer, liver cancer. Uh, and we, there it is again, slightly different. Mm -hmm. The prediction would be, though, from our data, that it acts in the same way, but in a different context. Does the same drug work? And the answer was yes. Got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you.
And then so we despite see the fact that it was in a different environment, yep. uh, but the same drug, so that actually answers one of my questions. I'm thinking, well, doesn't it have to be specific to exactly that patient? No, and, not always. Oh, okay, not okay. Always. Well, so this makes it uh, a, a little more accessible. It does. Yeah. And so then we saw it in pancreas cancers, but not just any pancreas cancer. We saw it in a type of pancreas cancer called the KRAS wild type pancreas cancers. Okay. And the hypothesis, again, was the drug will work in this context. And that hypothesis was tested, so patients received it, uh, and there's been remarkable responses there. And so this same alteration or, or flavors, variants of this alteration, which we can interpret using the data that we get, uh, seems to anticipate responses to this drug. And so that's now in the database. We publish that. We share that data with the world. And now other jurisdictions uh, are also able to say when they see this, that there's data that suggests a response to this particular drug. So how do you get that data into uh, all oncologists' hands? We write about it, so yeah. this is a very important thing to do. So we publish this in, in the peer-reviewed literature. So we publish our observations in a way that arm's length reviewers can critique our study and, and make improvements or, or reject the study, of course. Um, but it's been published hmm. and it's been picked up by, by others. So. This particular incident I'm talking about with the KRAS wild type pancreas cancers uh, had a commentary from uh, an investigator at Dana Farber that accompanied the journal article that suggests that this business of trying to find these things ought to be standard mm -hmm. in the KRAS wild type pancreas cancers because the benefits are, are so significant. The no. other way we do it no. okay. is we take all of the data, the genomic data, and we share it through a controlled access database. And right now we're using the European Genome and Phenome Archive, or EGA. Okay. And the reason we're using that is because the, the data there is protected and only legitimate uh, investigators can gain access to it for approved purposes. And so in that way, bioinformaticians or computational biologists, people sophisticated in the analysis of the data at legitimate jurisdictions can recrunch the data and use the data in the context of their own studies to promote uh, the local advances in their jurisdictions that they need. So what status does our research here collectively in British Columbia hold globally? Like are we a center of focus for many other researchers to come to us saying, okay, I want to I turn to you because you're doing something that is unique. So I think what we have recognized is that, that British Columbia is a relatively small jurisdiction. Yeah. And so especially with samples and with health issues and the great stresses on healthcare systems that we see today, you know, the, the question of could we accept samples coming in from all over, turn them over in some way and feed them back out to the world is a bit daunting. What we instead do is we provide our standard, standard operating procedures. So this is how we do this, this is how we do that. We describe in, in gory detail uh, all the uh, measurements that we take, all the computer systems that we use, and we provide that in the literature as a framework. Mm -hmm. The obligation that we must honor is an obligation to publish in high-quality peer-reviewed journals to, to make the case. Mm -hmm. Our latest big paper has just come out in Annals of Oncology a little while ago, uh, and we describe our experiences with 570 of these cases and the clinical impacts of being able to measure the parameters that we measure. Uh, and it was judged significant enough to warrant an editorial, which was written uh, by uh, investigators in, in Europe, uh, who called uh, the editorial Bridging the Implementation Gap. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they recognize that this is what we're trying to do. And they also recognize how this aligns to other programs around the world that are going in that direction, one of which is the International Cancer Genomics Consortium, uh, which uh, currently has a, an addendum ARGO. So it's ICGC ARGO. Mm -hmm. And for the life of me, I can't remember what ARGO <laughs> means. But anyway, that's mm -hmm. a, a, another consortium to All which right. we belong, and we're trying to move the world in this direction. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you.
Do we bring a unique uh, advantage based on the multicultural, uh, I guess, complexity of our um, community? Like, you can have people from around the world here in British Columbia. Yes. That a lot of other countries may have a more homogeneous population. Yes, yes. So uh, does that actually add to the value of what we're doing well, here? Well, I, I think so. Uh, and, yeah. and so this business of heterogeneity, and yeah. you said homogeneity, and, and that was a good word because it prompted me to think a little bit about fundamentally what is cancer. Right. So cancer is, is a collection of diseases, a couple hundred or more, uh, that are, and as you alluded in your introductory comments, incredibly heterogeneous. So what, what do I mean by that? I mean that um, if you take, uh, let's take lymphoma, uh, follicular lymphoma, a type of lymphoma. You can take one follicular lymphoma and another follicular lymphoma, and you can do the thing that I am describing, sequence them. And you can say even though they're both follicular lymphoma, they can and usually will differ hugely in, in some of the details of, of the dysregulated pieces of DNA that appear to be driving the cancer. So what does that imply? Well, what it implies is that even for a, a diagnosis of cancer X or cancer Y, the fundamental details cannot be guessed at. They have to be read out. So this heterogeneity uh, is, is between cancers, even the same cancer. Mm -hmm. There's heterogeneity between the backgrounds of the people that house these cancers, they're different. And then when you start getting into the individual cells, within the malignancy, they can be very different from each other. Yeah. <laughs> so there's all these layers of heterogeneity to malignancy, and in part, I think this heterogeneity is partly why cancer has been such a tough nut to crack globally. So as you're talking about this, I remember doing some work about pharmacogenomics and looking at what is the response of a particular statin to a, a patient and going, oh, so if you're a male of this ethnic background mm. living in this area and you're a smoker, there's going to be a different reaction than if you have all those markers, but you're not a smoker. Mm. Um, so how do you sort that your way through that? Even though you say, yeah, we see that drug worked here and it worked there, different patient, different yep. uh, you know, set of genetic circumstances. How do you know that you're going to be able to navigate your way around all those other potential roadblocks? But you don't know. Uh, and, okay. And, and, so that's, and that's what research is about. And that's what the research is all about. So the, yeah. the question is, you know, how do we make inroads into what we know is a big problem? What is the most logical path forward that we can do here mm -hmm. in, in, in Vancouver and BC? Yeah. How can we start to, to push this horizon? And these challenges that you're describing are not just challenges for our health systems here, they're challenges for health systems around the world. And in many respects, uh, what's going on at BC Cancer is, is very advanced in the sense that we have trained, and by we I, I mean Dr. Janessa Laskin, uh, the lead medical oncologist for POG and her team of, of uh, uh, colleagues, have trained uh, something like 80% of the medical oncologists in British Columbia wow to enroll a patient in POG and to, to interpret the data. So this, this is extremely unusual at any level, never, never mind a provincial level. So we've got that. Mm -hmm. So these people, these very, very talented physicians who are now savvy in, in interpreting genomic readouts, uh, are positioned to say, well, what do we need to know next in order to bring benefit to our patients? And, and this is the kind of interaction between science and clinic where a lot of very wonderful things can happen. So the, the clinicians say, we need pharmacogenomics, i.e. we need to know how the genetic background of the patient uh, might influence their reaction to certain drugs. And so there needs to be a way to do that, a standard way to do it, a standard way to communicate it. And we actually have a working group that designs reports that can mm. be consumed by, by clinicians and pharmacogenomics is one of the reporting systems that are, are being developed actively and will continue to be at, uh, developed. Third and final break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you.
Okay, how do you do this as a collective? Like, where does the, the, the drive to do it as a collective come from? Where does the funding come from? Because it's not like developing a drug uh, that you can do within a silo. This, this really does take a global village. It, and that's why the, the whole concept of publication and the obligation to publish your results in, in high quality venues, peer reviewed venues comes in. So mm -hmm. we, can, we can take in the literature base, and it is huge. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. say that we're completely up on the literature, but there are now uh, tools that we can use to help us read the literature and parse the literature, natural language processing tools, you know, machine learning is coming on board as, as a way to help with some of these things. We can take the literature. We can distill from the literature uh, observations that are relevant to that patient, associate those observations to that patient profile, and we can record that in a database, mm -hmm. a knowledge base. And we come back to that knowledge base again, and again, and again, and we constantly enrich it. And it's growing and growing, and we're providing it now to right. other jurisdictions, and they are, are growing their own local versions it, of this. Right, so it's this interconnected uh, yep. communities working together. It, it's bas basically a crowdsourcing kind of thing that's mm -hmm. being done. Now, we can't rely on that. We have to drive our own initiatives here. Mm -hmm. We have uh, you know, a considerable uh, patient population that we have to consider. So. You know, maybe a, a third to a half of patients that present will present with metastatic disease. These are people that need solutions, and we, we think that it's very important to align POG to that population, but not only that population. There's pediatric POG and, and various things. Yeah. The funding is critical here. Yeah. So, so the motivation to go in this direction, I think, comes from a variety of different sources. I believe the physicians would, would say that this is unique and powerful and provides uh, an interesting and important venue, an avenue for their patients to get the best care that they can provide. Mm -hmm. and, and physicians want to provide the best care. I, I feel that very strongly, yeah. uh, and I certainly know it's true amongst my colleagues. So there, there is a clinical motivation to go in this direction. The researchers that are engaged, you know, as researchers, we, we, you know, hide behind our computer screens and deep in, in some dingy basement under a naked light bulb waiting for the eureka moment and all that <laughs> stuff. Uh, you know, the, phys the, the, the clinicians see patients and they get enrichment from the interactions they have. You know, the researchers look at a computer screen or <laughs> play with test tubes. So, so as researchers, we know that we can make a difference. And that is a very, very powerful and enriching experience to have as a researcher. So the motivation from the research side is, yeah, we want to help people. We study cancer. These people have cancer. Can we help them? So there's motivation. So are you helping now, or is this something that the average person won't be able to realize for years to come? I think the average person will not be able to get access to this until the scale of funding that supports it is commensurate with the population and the population burden of cancer. Right. It's still research. It is not standard of care. Mm -hmm. So that's an important realization. We can't stop doing it just because it's research. What we have to do is do the right research to present the arguments that someday, for some populations at least, this ought to become standard of care. Why would we not make the most detailed measurements we can make, if we can do it cost effectively and at scale, and present that to the largest possible audience for consumption and for improving the health of British Columbians and Canadians and everybody else? Why would we not? So we have to find a way forward. And this is where the funding is so absolutely critical, because none of this could be done without the support of the BC Cancer Foundation, without the support of Genome British Columbia, and most recently without the support of the Terry Fox Research Institute through their Marathon of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center Network program. But isn't the main beneficiary out of all this, number one, the patients, but then the healthcare system itself? Uh, well, ultimately, uh, so. <laughs> ultimately, it depends what the healthcare system wants to achieve. And right. So, you know, what is the job of the healthcare system? And I'm not going to get into that too deeply. It's a different discussion. It's a different discussion. Yeah. But if the aspiration of the healthcare system with respect to cancer is to provide the very best care possible, then this is a direction that needs to be seriously considered. Now, one of the collaborators we have in the context of, of POG uh, is uh, Dean Regeer, Dr. Dean Regeer. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Dean Regeer is an economist uh, who specializes in health services research. And as an economist, and from his particular perspective, he has a very vital role to play in, in moving this forward into a more accessible domain, potentially a, a provincially funded domain or a federally funded domain. 
he has to say it is in this context, um, mm -hmm. pick your cancer or cancers, uh, and it has to come in at this cost. And here's, here are all the assumptions behind this calculation. So it's complicated and mathematically intensive, and that's why we need a specialist uh, looking at the data and making these arguments. And Dean has created a raft of publications along with his team uh, at BC Cancer that explains what is being done for the economic aspects of this. So that's part of it too. Yeah. Um, we're trying to attack the problem on as many fronts as possible, on medical fronts, on research fronts, and on economic fronts. Well, I wanted to have you come in for this conversation for a couple of reasons. One, to let people know what's going on, but also, two, to kind of like, you know, blow the BC horn. Like, we're doing some good stuff here. Mm -hmm. We really are. Yes, we are. Yeah. I'm very proud of, of the POG program. I'm very proud of our clinicians. Yeah. They have stepped up. Uh, in ways that, you know, many jurisdictions simply could not. And it, it's very, very grassroots. So it's a beautiful thing to see people come together to attack a common problem like this. It's, it's really gratifying. Good. Now go get back behind your computer screen and do more research. I will do so. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.